is what one is trying to do is explore miracles it's it's probably looking at things a little bit the wrong way to say induce miracles but it's something mm. that can at least be understood in that in that respect if there are miracles of this kind they're not violations of nature mm. um they are extreme improbabilities like the, yeah. the, the yeah. word in the bible is, is astonishment they are astonishing astonishing improbabilities that overwhelm any notion that this could be a matter simply of chance within mm. within a, an ordinary conception of a mechanical uh, universe and so one is finding one the tools one needs for this are obviously tools that can capture and i would say you know rigorously quantify coincidences mm. i want to do a brief introduction here though which characterizes what i see is so significant about who we are speaking with today and it's very important for the rest of the talk there's information here that's needed to understand it and i'll start with a quote by dr john d the Elizabeth elizabethan sage i have from my youth up desired and prayed unto god for pure and sound wisdom and understanding of truths natural and artificial for many years and in many places, far and near, I have sought and studied many books in sundry languages and have conferred with sundry men and have labored with my own reasonable discourse to find some inkling, gleam or beam of those radical truths I sought. But after all my endeavors, I could find no other way to attain such wisdom but by the extraordinary gift and not by any vulgar school, doctrine or human intervention. John D. Now, philosophy, the academic discipline, was and is in a state of decay and entropy. It is, by definition, not enacting its speculative role to be a culture's pole of maximum abstraction. It's intrinsically experimental intelligence expressing the liberation of cognitive abilities from immediate practical application and their testing against ultimate problems, in Nick Land's words. Rather, it is a rot resting in the self-referential critique within the logos and the known, far away from what is closest and completely unseen. The outside, as Nick Land calls it, the unknown, the enigma of the edge of time, the ground of reality, that the earliest philosophers, pagan mystics, were unceasingly enthralled by. After Nietzsche, the inventive phenomenological school and method of Husserl emerges. This method attempts to turn away from millennia of propositional philosophy directly to the phenomena given perspectively to us to seek the outside, using tools of destructuring, deconstruction, among others, to try escape the modern mind frame in an effort to reach the outside, unknown. Heidegger, Husserl's student, turns these tools on philosophy itself and ontology in an attempt to reach the primordial matrix or primordial being and actually achieve perspectival access, not just as an idea or a concept, in an approach which would be characterized as a kind of inside out house cleaning to again reach the ultimate ground of reality. This method is later warped and corrupted by the using Franco Academy, which spreads like a virus to the Anglo Academy until we reach the state of decay, an environment that Nick Land finds himself with at Warwick University in the 90s as a young professor. Like the greats before him, such as Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, he turns away from the stagnation towards truth and the primordial enigmas and the primordial questions in a quest for speculative experimentation and maximum abstraction that is the way of the actual philosopher as a method, not a profession. He rejects the Franco Academy's critical methods. He rejects the tools of the phenomenological school and forges his own original way, which you could characterize as, if our goal is the outside, our methods and practices must also be of this outside. To have the radical contact with the unknown that the phenomenologists were after from the human side with their inside out method. This to me is incredible. It's not merely the next philosopher in the chain who writes another book and advances another critique or deconstruction. This is a radical turn, another unofficial school and a kind of Greenwood outlaw chaotic rift in the stagnant academy. As a professor at Warwick in the 90s, he forms the CCRU, the Cybernetics Cultural Research, a liminal space, 
and I would call a Greenwood, which synchronously is down the road from Robin Hood's outlaw Greenwood in Barnsdale in the Ballads in England. Warwick is the university. Uh, his rigorous use of methodology from non-philosophical disciplines and even non-human, so to speak, machine cybernetics, schizoanalysis, cryptography, numerology, esotericism, performance, art, anthropology, grammatology, and Kabbalah, and, num and numerical anti-language. His speculations and rigorous application of machine cybernetics of capital and technology directly to culture and being, to communal ritual and performance, led to an autodidactic cultural output from outside. His innovations of thought show their influence decades later, appearing in cognitive science under different names such as we space, communal we space, distributed cognition, extended cognition. Predictions Nick made 30 years ago are still coming true today, one after the other, like being ticked off a checklist. And so Nick may not agree with this characterization, but it's obvious to me that here is not only a great Englishman, but a great philosopher of the likes of Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. It's figures like this who deserve ultimate respect because not only are they radically innovative, but they put everything on the line in pursuit of truth or reward, position and titles. It's the truth and the mission by any means necessary. It's the attitude or that attitude itself that makes people like this an invasion from the outside, the unknown, the primordial itself, not merely men probing to see it, but they are its inception. Its inception. That doesn't really do it full justice, but to get a full picture, there's two links in the description to the introduction from Fanged Numina and also an article which talks about the CCRU. And also you can get the CCRU book, which gives you a examples of the cultural output that it made, which are very strange indeed and are related to the hyperstition con uh, concept that we go into. A fascinating talk with Nick. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a great uh, honor to even have him speaking on the channel. So without further ado, Here's the conversation. Hope you enjoy it. You don't necessarily have to comment on what I've just said there, but um, perhaps on the John D quote to begin with. That's my view anyway. Well, there's obviously a lot, a lot there. I mean, I, I hope this isn't going to, after such an extraordinary introduction, uh, disappoint everyone too, too hugely. But for sure, uh, I appreciated the John D quote a lot. He is a, one of my favorite people. I could just start with a very little piece of potted history, just to say that Please. the CCIU was basically active in the 1990s. From my point of view, at least, it had a kind of climactic moment in a, a kind of event collaboration with an art group called Orphan Drift, and it was heading towards the millennium. So that was a definitely a theme. I mean, at that time, there was a big concern about the Y2K bug, you know, and that computers were going to crash. So there was a kind of techno apocalyptic undercurrent to, to people's expectations. Might be helpful just to say what hyperstition is. Um, uh, yeah, of course, these are difficult subjects, but I think that's OK. way the CCIU was thinking in the 1990s, our diagnosis of the way cybernetics have been used was not only that its application tended perhaps to be rather narrow to specific mm. gadgets and instruments and technical systems narrowly conceived, but also there was a massive prevalence given to the notion of negative rather than positive feedback. Mm. So it was much more interested in control in the sense of maintaining things at a certain range, you know, that when it drifts off a, a, a goal or a target range, it's brought back. Um, that's what the mechanism does. It brings it back mm. to, to a, to a uh, predefined goal state and, mm. and narrows its range of behavior. It seemed to us that if you're applying it to most especially capitalism, modernity, mm. as a socio-historical phenomenon, it's it's positive feedback that is the crucial phenomenon. Mm. That of course, there are all kinds of negative feedbacks. There are all kinds of these control systems and maintaining yeah. equilibrium. But the main, the fundamental phenomenon is explosion. It's mm. it's that 
some input. Marx's obviously formula for capital is um, M money goes to commodity, goes to M2 mm. uh, in a cycle. And that, that cycle is inflationary, it's explosive. Um, and that, so capitalism is essentially something based on a positive feedback dynamic. Mm. And hyperstition really then emerges for us or emerged for us as a as, as the most simple way of applying this to cultural phenomena yeah. in general. As to say, it's about how things uh, access a positive feedback dynamic in order mm. to explode mm. and therefore come roughly from nothing, mm. from the infinitesimal yeah. to, to become huge. And, and it looks like something basically just bursting into existence yeah um, yeah something coming out of virtuality and yes. making itself making itself real yeah um, so whether explicitly or implicit yes that was a very important guiding concept um, yeah I think this speaks to well, what I what comes to me when I when you say that is that firstly, and you have alluded to this with some of your tweets and whatnot, which is if you are, say, in the cybernetics research unit, firstly, where does it come from? Uh, in the sense that, OK, if you're generating effects that are, well, let me just put it this way, is that it's not simply that it's a social phenomena. It's not simply that, that this, it's social effects that are generated like superstition. It's the fact that in this ground of uncertainty, and there are priors for establishing a uh, hyperstitional environment that you have set out and you did for that research unit, uh, a ground of uncertainty, a ground of unbelief. I've got them here, but I won't go into. But I think this a good way of explaining it is that it seems to generate effects in reality this hyperstition it's not only a social phenomena is that it and perhaps forwards and backwards uh, in time so to speak but it generates synchronous effects so if you look to carl jung and wolfgang pauli's uh, theory about synchronicity uh, and a causal connecting principle it's gener it generates would you say that it also generates a causal effects it's not only that things come to be that it's uh, a causally at least not directly causal as we understand billiard balls hitting billiard balls. It has effects yeah, no, outside of it. Absolutely, for sure, true. I mean, yeah. it, it's a, a causal is a complicated word and it's probably not always used in the same sense. Um, it's used very interestingly by by different groups, I think. And, and the, the, uh, the usage it has mostly in... I think what we call the rationalist community, where it was connected with various types of developments of um, game theory as mm -hmm. a way to understand how you can actually interact with something without any causal yeah. contact. Therefore, you know, anywhere in space or time, um, you can. You, it's an extremely sorcerous notion yeah. like that. Um, yeah. um, so I, I think it's a, definitely a, a good word. It's partly a placeholder, perhaps. I mean, mm. you know, we, we, we just say a causal because we're, all it is doing is marking a disengagement from, from a certain notion of causality. But obviously that notion of causality is so prevalent mm. and so dominant that to separate from it provisionally even is 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 not a small step and, and it opens mm. up vistas that are not deeply explored what were because it's been a long time since the ccru what were the most effective means of which of of being able to of being able to receive information from that outside has it changed since what you originally would say uh, when you were doing, probably in about 2004, I've read on the Hyperstition blog, um, 
have there have there been new uh, practices that you've engaged with that have uh, revealed information from outside, uh, and not just only information which numerology probably reveals, but um, perhaps perspectively. You know, before sort of advancing to the crux of your question, which is this thing about method for um, accessing the outside, which I think mm. is definitely central, I think should mm. be central to this whole discussion. Mm. Um, I just would like to say that a crucial experience for me in relation to the CCIU is how much uh, there is a sense of the retrospective about it. That's to say, what one finds out one was doing is very belated. So, um, mm. for instance, just in terms of um, a sort of Kabbalistic numerology, mm. uh, it was during the kind of central CCIU period that from somewhere, I mean, I've been asked how this came and honestly, I can't give any detail, but somewhere we formulated the, what we call uh, the alphanumeric Kabbalah. It's a very simple yeah. English gematria or, or numerization and used it a little bit. I mean, it was confirmed for us in its value by the fact that the, um, uh, current 93 mantra, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, yeah. came to 777, which is the name, obviously, of Crowley's major Kabbalistic yeah. work. So it seems to us that was extremely strong confirmation. Mm. But only very recently have I learned that the cybernetic culture research unit by alphanumeric Kabbalah comes to 666. Hmm. Um, so <laughs> we have the You're kidding. Wow. We have That's the funny. At Beaconsfield, because it's the triangle yeah. of 36, and 36 is has a very important place on this diagram that was very, very important to our work that we uh, called the numagram. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, so because there's a gate 36 and the triangle of 36 is 666, we had 666 marked quite prominently in chalk on the, on the wall of this Beaconsfield <coughs> art space. But the yeah. fact that the cybernetic culture research unit itself is being, you know, um, endorsed by the number 666, it was something very, very recent yeah. Uh, yeah, as a right. discovery. And so it, it's really crucial in the way that I look about this whole history uh, that we really didn't know what we were doing. You yeah. know, like a lot, it's like things were being done, things were being said, words were being constructed and things were being written. And what they mean yeah. is not something that can be derived from any kind of lucid yes. motives or intentions that can be dated back to the to the point where those things yeah. emerge. And so really then the, uh, the task that is kind of suggested by that is, you know, whatever was actually going on, such that things were being retrieved in a way that was just not understood, but clearly mm. was happening, is, mm. is something that one wants to methodically pursue and sort of, yeah. uh, it, it's not that being, it's not at all that being conscious of what one is doing is the crucial thing. We are proving mm. that that is, but mm. at the same time, seeing retrospectively what, was happening does yeah. give some suggestions concerning method that can be currently applied, if that makes any sense. No, it does, uh, to me. Um, what does it, what does that suggest uh, of method that would aid in... That is well, the question I that maybe... Sorry. 
Yeah. Sorry, no, no. Do, do, do. It's strange to many people because it's a very difficult phenomena to investigate. Like our exchange on Twitter, it's a hard thing to say, here's the empirical data of exactly where it unfolds quantitatively, but perhaps you can uh, expand on some of the empirical uh, uh, observations uh, that you have made since then uh, of seeing these effects play out and then go to that question is what what developments did that talk to, uh, speak to? Well, obviously, I think, like you say, it's not very easy to run this kind of stuff through speech. Writing is a much better medium for this kind of thing. And it's, it's partly because the methodical question is about exactness. Things can be framed in different ways. One of the, one of the ways to frame this is really about miracles. Mm. You know, what, what is a miracle? Previous notion of the miraculous or the dominant assumed notion of what a miracle was that I think is still the most common actually was something that just was uh, in contravention of the laws of nature was some yeah. interruption of of natural law in order to communicate some uh, revelatory divine message in the 17th century there is the most extraordinary intense mixture of the new science and very, very, again, intense Christian religious religious commitment. But throughout the 17th century, it was possible for there to be someone like Newton, who was an, a, a kind of fanatical Protestant Christian, and mm. also obviously the father of modern mechanistic science, as we understand it. And, and, and those two things, far from compromising each other, were held together in this, you know, both at a state of absolute maximum um, intensity. At that point, the understanding of what a miracle was underwent this huge change because mm. it was no longer seen as a, an interruption or violation of natural law. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was seen instead as something that was communicated through the channel mm. of natural law. So for instance, okay. uh, you know, looking at the, the Bible, um, the flood, uh, the Noah's flood, mm. which previously it was that uh, God b broke into the laws of nature in order to produce this deluge, uh, mm. you know, to, to uh, undertake a kind of, process of spiritual purification for all these protestants for newton things were so set up uh, cosmically by the divine omniscience and uh, omnipotence that um a comet hit hits the earth and floods the earth at exactly the point it's needed by this yeah. uh, divine purpose you know, i.e. that what we're talking about now is coincidence. Yes. So a miracle doesn't any longer require a violation of natural law. All the, all the arguments against miracles that say, no, no, you know, there are never interruptions in nature. There's just a failure to understand. None of that becomes an argument against miracles anymore. In this mm. particular... I think it's very English, 17th century conception. It's completely immune from that kind of argument. I think that one framing is, is what one is trying to do is explore miracles. It's, it's probably looking at things a little bit the wrong way to say induce miracles, but it's something mm. that can at least be understood in that, in that respect. If there are miracles of this kind, they're not violations of nature, Mm. Um, they are extreme improbabilities. Like the, yeah. the yeah. word in the Bible is, is astonishment. They are astonishing, astonishing improbabilities that overwhelm any notion that this could be a matter simply of chance within mm. within a, an ordinary conception of a mechanical 
uh, universe. And so one is finding one the tools one needs for this are obviously tools that can capture and I would say, you know, rigorously quantify coincidences. Mm. Yeah. Uh, now, this is something that is not easy to, to do in speech. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, I, far be it from me to say it's impossible. I mean, you know, literally anything could happen. As I say, I think, you know, because the, because the outside is the, is the real agent here, who mm. knows what is happening? And, and this conversation we're having right now might turn out to have peculiar content that yes. neither of us at this yeah. point are recognizing. You, you know, that wouldn't, frankly, be a matter of enormous surprise to me, really, if that, mm. if that was something we were later to discover. Yeah, but in the most, in the most straightforward sense, I don't really think that I can helpfully articulate what I would call an eloquent, uh, what I would call eloquent miracles, on in a in a verbal channel. I think I think you Maybe. have to be really, you know, down in a in a set of uh, words and numbers i mean maybe i can help here in the sense that at least walking people in to some empirical results that are, are, are well at least i would say are certainly connected with this type of phenomena where you have quantum mechanics at the ground of quantum mechanics you've got the double slit experiment where the observer is at the very ground of uh, you know particle movement is having an effect uh, in the experiment, and Wolfgang Pauli, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, demonstrates this in Jung's uh, essay, talks about it, is that the choice of experiment, the observer is having some form of effect on, on whether a particle is a wave or, or appears as a particle. That's just a very simple example. I'm not going to speculate on the ramifications of that. There's a million different interpretations of what it is, but there's that and there's also the placebo effect. And these are two things that are recognized that people can... Uh, look to oh. and i think they're obviously connected with this in my view of course but um i just that's just might be a way of people getting into what we're talking about um yeah what do you think of that yeah. i don't know if you know about yeah. that there must be some connection between the the synchronicity theory that jung described and and the effects of, of quantum mechanics that are enigmas i i'm sure that uh you know, obviously, hyperstition is something that has completely sort of gone off on its own and is living in the wild now. And I think lots of people are interested in in using it um, very much in the sense that you're uh, in the way you're describing it. You come across it in many places unexpectedly, and and so for sure, people. I think if they if they hunted if they hunted around the web using that word as a key, uh, they would find all kinds of things and then following connections, mm -hmm. uh, who knows what it would uh, lead into. I mean, I, I, I obviously have only, you know, a tip of the iceberg sort of sense of what is out there like this. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's for sure right. I mean, I was mainly, I think I was, Looking at this a little bit more narrowly than than you were, Scott, in terms of yeah, um, in terms of the question of evidence for communication from the outside, it might be with hyperstition that the, that someone could be satisfied. I think probably the CCIU was largely satisfied with an extremely uh, you know, secular history understanding of what hyperstition was. It was an extremely yeah. powerful, counterintuitive piece of cultural positive feedback dynamics. Um, yeah. But it, there was nothing about it that necessarily was um, miraculous. I would say my interest now definitely is more on things that are manifestly miraculous. Yeah. In that I think that when you're talking about in initiation, the 
the first step of initiation, I think, sorry, I'm going to say something that I don't even think I agree with, uh, 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 sort of I'm contradicting it in my own mind at the very moment I'm saying, but I'll say it anyway. Um, the, the first stage of initiation is to realize that there is a fundamental structure of illusion in which mm. we are enmeshed. I think our great myths of modern people from the late 20th century to now are mostly popular movies. Um, yeah. And I think there's two that are hugely important in shaping you know, the basic mythological structure of people's thinking, mm. and which are the first Terminator movie yeah. and the first Matrix movie. And both of them are, in a certain sense, Gnostic movies. Mm. I mean, the, the Matrix particularly. Um, so obviously we have this language of red pills and blue pills mm. completely circulating, you know, freely now. I think it's a reference point for everyone. To take the red pill is to see that everything that you had thought was authoritative reality mm. was an extremely fine-grained structure of illusion. When you go back, uh, you know, to the book of Revelation, that in their technology, the, the metaphor let's say for that, was in the apocalypse, in, the, in Revelation, the universe disappears as if a scroll is rolled up. Hmm. That's, their, that's the technology they, they have for that thought, that Gnostic, Gnostic insight, that, that what you had thought was reality is actually something written on a scroll that, that is rolled up and then you're somewhere, mm. you're somewhere else. You've crossed over out of the matrix. If I was choosing, I would it'd be better to say into the matrix, but whatever. We've gone from kind of computer simulation, video games. These mm. are all we now have accessible as kind of uh, metaphorical engines for this Gnostic thought. Mm. In, in the first century, they had scrolls but it's basically the same it's basically yeah. the same thought and it can no doubt undergo further elaboration i mean it's so i would say you know it's a mistake to get too caught up in the metaphor say. it's like of course people are right when they say well you're you know that's just the metaphor because where we are in history and that's the state of our technology and you know people thought the brain was a telephone exchange and then they thought it was a computer and boom, boom, boom. And they're using these particular metaphors because that's what's available. It's, it's mm. the same, but none of that, it seems to me is wrong or a problem. Yeah. I mean, it was helpful to be able to think of the brain as a telephone exchange. And then and it's helpful to be able to think of it as a computer switching system and the neural network. And I mean, these things are all, positive and they they allow people to think things that were difficult to think clearly before and so i think the matrix movie it's got it's it's got huge problems we could talk about it if we wanted to go down that rabbit hole but i think the point is everyone understands it everyone's seen it everyone knows how to use the language mm -hmm. um and in that sense everyone has access to this basic gnostic Myth. But of course, they they think as probably a bit of fiction that it's a movie, that it's not serious, and that the world isn't ultimately like that. That it's not it's not really true. People think that we are enmeshed in a fine grain system of illusion or simulation. But I think they're wrong. I well, think, I, think, I think we. <laughs> manifestly oh and that and so that's yeah. the initiatory role of of eloquent miracles is to persuade people it's it's to take the red pill is to persuade people that actually everything they think is real 
is a simulation. And it's not even just a narrative. Of course, what we're also talking about here is what Heidegger and various people were doing. It's, it's also trying, and it is what we need now, is a radical breakout from the Cartesian brain, from the modernist worldview. Uh, with that in mind, would you say that the ancients, let's say Heraclitus, if you go far enough back, if they're, when they are in a experience with being, are they, to a degree, are, they are closer to this uh, primordial being. They're closer to this outside than we are now, right? So the let's say your previous sort of attacks on uh, that knowing space that we've created for ourselves that's disconnected us from this don't apply so much to them right because they are interacting in a way they are still in contact with because of that indeterminacy which i guess heidegger would have that's what fourfold is it's the indeterminacy between those things of primordial uh, or sacred space really would you yeah what do you think of that yes i mean i think you know among other things, they had the mysteries. So, um, I mean, everyone in the ancient world thought that um, oracles and prophecies were real. Mm. I think, you know, I, I don't, I think it, it seemed to people then, uh, in my understanding, that it was really almost beyond question that these were real things that um they obviously the most famous you know the oracles of delphi are obscure and difficult and you know all all the tragic stories involve misunderstandings of prophecy or battle responses inappropriate responses to prophecy attempt to avoid prophecy in a way that is self-fulfilling mm. um but the fact that there was prophetic communication mm. was something that people thought was of course true um you know i've been sort of reading herodotus recently and he just like he he tells a history of the world in which of course there is of yeah. course there is this level of oracular prophetic mysterious intervention in into the world and he doesn't he tries to be neutral and if not exactly skeptical like balanced and will say oh maybe you know maybe there was just a natural explanation but it's completely clear what he mm. believes is real um and and it is and it is that and so we are now in thinking that basically there is no outside. We are exceptional, you know, to, to think that we roughly know yes. what things are made of and that's all there is. And uh, there simply is, are, are no communications to be tapped into that exceed the terms of that. That is a, that is a very, that's a few centuries old. And, mm. um, yeah, so uh, I agree, I, and I don't think it's very robust. I think that we we've returned. Um, we're returning to something that is, in some levels, very archaic. Yeah, through yeah. the inevitable consequences of those scientific and technological ways of thinking, and obviously, artificial intelligence. I think is a very important example of that and yes. these rationalist these rationalists who were you know bef before it was anything more than a very pitiful toy were doing these thought experiments with as you say you know using game theory and knows notions of a causal trade and mm. they were basically engaged in sorcerous communication with the outside they just had a different they just had a different language for it that yeah. was computational and well the, and the action at a different uh, ac action at a different still occurs in the sense of 
in a very simple way that someone like Jonathan Pajot has talked about before when talking about hyper agents is that simply when you just because you send a signal via light, uh, say I give a rousing speech and I, it's sent over the Internet and it instigates a rebellion and then enormous amounts of physical energy, uh, uh, you know, uh, exerted by something that is unequal in terms of the energy that's given out by, say, me and the signal that's sent, even though that's not a causal, it's still sort of action at a distance, if that makes sense. Um, I just mean in a simple way that people can understand um, yeah. what we're talking. For sure. So what, so what can right, be seen from sort of inside the, the system as a process of <clears throat> radical amplification is mm. obviously open to this other frame of interpretation as something ingressing into the system. Um, yeah. Something that just was not there, uh, comes in, arrives. And the, the, what that looks like is phenomenon is, is of this amplification process, this takeoff, expansion, yeah. explosion. But, but you're seeing something arrive that wasn't inside before and, and now is. Yeah. Now, the, the, when you mentioned that seeing these effects are heightened as, because hyperstition is related to acceleration, um, right? As yeah. we accelerate, it should be the case that the effects of this principle, let's say, of hyperstition on re reality, quote unquote, should grow as we accelerate, right? And in a way, yeah, yeah people like Peugeot, or the people, their predictions, uh, he's a symbolic thinker and pe many people know, um, the flood is coming in that way. Um, and yeah. one speculation I had when I was looking uh, deeply into your, uh, the principles related to hyperstition was that uh, as hyperstition becomes more known, um, it should, I mean, it's really the only law that doesn't alter. <laughs> because if that's true, then any ontology can be altered by it, right? I mean, is that, that's sort of the ground of what speculative realism is. Yes, I mean, my, my, well, my hesitation here is only that speculative realism is, is, is a philosophical movement that I suspect would be uh, a bit resistant. To what ah yes, of course. The word you're saying. So I mean, you know, if so, if that word is used as a as a technical term like that, we're involved in a kind of philosophy world set of tribal conflicts that, that might be. Yeah. No. Well, let's just say well, these are speculations. I'm speculating here, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm prodding uh, Nick here. Uh, you know, I don't want you to say uh, have to say anything that uh, yeah. can be. You know, skewed in a certain way, but we, we, perhaps we should best stay to your terms uh, then, like hyperstition. But well, what was I going on with there? Would you agree that as it accelerates, uh, that these effects do seem to should will, will render themselves in reality itself in a heightened way as it goes on? And even if you hyperstition, hyperstitions itself, that feedback loop yeah. should keep. Growing and have I these... think everyone knows that we're in for more and more weirdness <clears throat> because because the, on the curve that we're on, uh, you know, just being very very commonsensical about it again, like comfortably embedded in secular history, and just talking about it yeah. in a very yes way. Um, there is a process that involves radically increasing sensitization to yeah. signs. So, you know, things are still getting hauled about, uh, you know, as, as they have always been in certain sense. But when things are put under, for, you know, first of all, certain kinds of managerial controls, and then, you know, telecommunications is brought into that and then computerization is brought into it and things go under what they call a numerical control and all the time the uh, power of uh, these microscopic electronic 
events, bits of information to actually manipulate the world and induce these huge changes, it becomes more and more powerful. So, you know, you, for instance, have, um, you have some kind of computer assisted or computerized stock trading in which the whole fate of companies is decided by some transition at the speed of light about whether something should be bought or sold, you know, on, on, a, on a stock exchange. And then the, the ripples from that cascade out into the world producing huge uh, effects. And this is only, this is, can only get more and more and more powerful. So in, in terms of, again, this extremely sort of just down to earth way of thinking about it, the mm. AI explosion is about this. It's about this kind of process of making the, the world, nature, the world of things hypersensitive mm. to science. And so this kind of effects that that produces, you know, are just manifestly weird to people. Yeah. The world yeah. seems to be going completely crazy. Um, um, it's, you know, you, you're not really, even though, even if you've got a model that it all neatly folds down into physics, which, which I think, as I say, the, in in terms of the the modern, sophisticated conception of miracles, that isn't in any way a problem. Yeah. Um. But it's, physics doesn't really help you. The things are happening that you, you that you realize intellectually. Okay, I could I could map this out as a massive set of physics equations. It's stuff moving yeah. about in space and time. But, but it, that's not what it seems like at all. What no. it seems like are these semiotic effects. It's the fact that, that you know, a word, a sign, a calculation, a, a, you know, solving some a numerical puzzle induces these vast transformations of the yeah. world. Um, and so I think people get an intuitive sense from that but that just like you say we're on this curve of accelerating weirdness yes and and it seems that if people want to confirm it for themselves there are a lot of people that just i mean look this is just one practice the i ching is one of them and there's computer scientist bernardo katstrop uh young i've to, uh, talk about the i ching uh you can just use it for yourself not only going to say any more than that, and that's something you can confirm for yourself, but something's incredibly yeah. strange and outside the logos and the known that we think of things, yet it somehow has these effects. I'm not going to describe them for you. You just have to do it yourself. All yeah. I can do is recommend uh, people yeah. who are extremely uh, rigorous, like you are yourself, uh, uh, Nick. You're ext extremely rigorous. People like yourself, like Bernardo Katzstrop, again, CERN computer scientist, a PhD philosopher talking about this odd book that has these effects. And uh, these, these effects uh, you see uh, seem to be happening in phenomena that you're just, just, you just described then. And also you could, you could say in the election of perhaps President Trump and the phenomena like your blog post about um, Keck and 4chan, not to go into deep into that, but just the synchronicities around that are incredibly strange. But I think that's a good way, anyway, for people to test it for themselves, right? Because, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. Yes, I think right. the thing is that, the, you know, <clears throat> taking it in a, in a series of steps, like once, once you have convinced yourself that you're in the matrix mm. and then you convinced yourself, which is hard. I mean, it, it requires a state. I don't think anyone, I'm going to put it like this, I don't think anyone can easily do it, even if intellectually they see it. It's your, everything about your, uh, the way your brain works is, is, is struggling against it. So even if you think, uh, you know, I know this is some kind of dream, yes. some kind of yes. st dream structure, I know it intellectually, but to actually experience it as that um, is, is very hard. I, I think yeah. it is a state of enlightened sentience, you know, that belongs to certain kind of uh, 
religious traditions to be kind exactly. of stably, stably inside that kind of insight. But you can, but you can intellectually grasp it, and then it follows from that that the channel of communication is basically operated from the other side. I mean, you're mm. not in charge of the telephone exchange. It's not you're not deciding how it works. You're not setting up the code. What well, all you have to do is offer the opportunity for something to communicate. And that's what mm. all the things that you're talking about are. They're, they're, they're channels, you know? Like, yes. if people use the I Ching, they're giving something the opportunity to mm. transmit information. Yes. And it's, I Ching's a very nice example because the information is so consonant with what we know about information or the way we talk about information yeah. in, in our own epoch of information technology in terms of you know packets of binary mm. binary code. Um, and from that you you can have sensible expectations, which is that you're gonna just get randomness. Yeah. And if you don't <laughs> get randomness, yeah. then you mm. have at least the effect of communication. There was a Canadian experiment, I'm afraid I don't, I'm not gonna remember the details of it, but I think is extremely um, telling, where uh, in some class, I think it was maybe comparative religion or something like that. The, the, the teacher had a bunch of, uh, I think graduate students, and said to them, okay, what we're going to do is invent a religion, invent like mm. a cult-like religion, which we know is, is false. We know it's just made up. You're going to make it up right now, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's not coming from any sort of organized tradition. It's something that's designed to be bogus. Mm. You, you invent this bogus religion, and you invent bogus rituals and you conduct those rituals for a week and see what happens all the students come back saying my god this no. crazy stuff started happening you know it was like somehow somehow it's real um yeah. you know we did this stuff we were taking the piss basically and actually <laughs> it's like oh my god it just really strange occurrences and so I think this is very much what you're saying, isn't it? I mean, it's like you you just produce the opportunity for these things mm. and see what happens. Like, mm. you know, what have you got? What have you got to lose? You know, I guess my Christian friends will say, other than your immortal soul or something. Yeah. Some <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, but still, you thing, know, if you're not Christian, though, it's. I would say this is a bridge to that. And that's what Jung has been for a lot of people to eventually end yeah, up in sure. the faith. So then there are Christians that watch this channel that would say, oh, God, if we're going Crowley, you know, whatever. But well, hang on. It's it's these something simple as the I Ching. Again, it's for people that are stuck in this matrix, which is very simply has been talked about by many uh, philosophers. And it's a matrix of our own making. I think people can understand that is that our very knowing of being has given form to how we're stuck with seeing being. I mean, that's pretty uh, simple. You know, it seems pretty simple for people to understand that. Um, and the fact that uh, there are ways you, you can get that conceptually, and that's the beginning, to be able to perhaps move on to practices that might even end up to the ancient Orthodox Church. Let's talk about, for instance, yeah, for uh, sure. Christian Church. Yeah. Which, and, and we can agree that they, it seems to me, because they, they got they their theology says God is uncreated, so that seems to be uh, and makes sense that that is uh, giving them access and their symbolic practices and initiations are giving them access to this sacred space. It's breaking out of the very way they're talking about it is the same way you are. So it, it shouldn't be you know they're always saying uh, escaping this world, and it seems ontologically to align very well with what Heidegger talks about and what you you talk about. So it's not something that. You know, I guess people have been branded heretics since time immemorial <laughs> for talking yeah. about it. But moving on to initiation, I think that's worth our side of things, our guys to consider. If people are stuck in this 
biologism brain in this uh, hyper, um, hyper, what would you call it? Hyper, I guess it's kind of uh, Spurg brain. It's where you can't see that there's something outside. Um, right. That there, there are practices that you, one can engage in. You, you can just be muffled up so much in this, mm. in this confidence, in articulate confidence that yes. there's nothing behind. That you, and of course you won't then find anything. Or, or again, you know, I mean, something from outside could just kick the door down. I mean, that's yeah. probably something that could happen. So when it comes to acceleration, what do you, with growing effects of, we see of entropy sort of pulling back down, what, what do you feel about the prospects of it? Um, obviously, there are forces here at work that are battling on both sides of it, it, it seems. It's not just a matter of the entropy of regular time. It does seem like a Lilith archetype, let's say, yeah. is pulling back the other way. Do you, have you changed any of your ideas about acceleration based on that? And how does that fit or compete with a kind of Spenglerian view of, of, a, of yeah. decline versus, yeah? Yes, I, okay, this is good. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a lot here. Um, I think the first thing that's worth saying is about the, this complex that you've you touched on to do with accelerationism and these thermodynamic notions about <clears throat> entropy. Uh, there's obviously one way of, of organizing one's thoughts about this, that sort of entropy is a bad thing. <clears throat> and what you're trying to do is escape entropy, move in the opposite direction of entropy to the degree that that's possible. Mm. I think ultimately that's not the best way to think about it. I think um, there's now this movement, which I'm sure you've kind of uh, come across, that it's quite active on the internet, and it calls itself E. Yeah. Yes, I've seen your comments on that. Um, again, it's one of those things is unpronounceable or it's something you can only write. <laughs> yeah. um, and and I, I think it's a really interesting little name. I think it's like a, obviously, that accelerationism, one of the things I really like about it is, is that it just is incredibly uh, splitty. I mean, you know, and and this little semiotic sort of um, slash act where people can stick something at the front to mark the fact that there's been another split or divergence or something has split split <laughs> off into another form of acceleration. I I, I, I absolutely adore that. And yeah. EAC is the most recent one that I know about of any seriousness at least. And I think it's very solid on this question uh, about um, entropy, uh, which is that what one wants in a machine or what is accelerating is entropy production. Mm. That's to say, you know, you what the, the, the goal of this thing, the more powerful it is, the more productive it is, uh, is the amount of entropy it's producing. Yeah. Um, and everything, you know, life produces entropy more than the inorganic and intelligence produces entropy faster than stuff that was not intelligent. And, you know, as we computerize and, the, the, you know, the socio-technical system becomes more and more elaborate, it's, it's mm. ability to output entropy steadily uh, increases mm. you know so it's basically it's like you know the, it's the amount of chaos that you can absorb or that you can manage or deal with that really is the indicator of sort of health and advance and all of these things um, it's not that you want order against chaos you want you want to just basically have something that can tolerate Great yes. amount of chaos. So, well, yeah, I was story. talking about uh, it was between your faith in acceleration as compared oh, to a decline with Spengler. Is that uh, has yes, the situation yes. of this Lilith that's emerging? Let's call it woke, whatever it want. Has that and that yeah. this pulling back of acceleration changed your view about acceleration, 
Uh, yeah. and, and I mentioned also that Lilith seems like it does seem like it's not just time. It seems like it's almost a figure trying to pull back uh, acceleration in a way. This, yeah. this equalizing force of wokeness. And yeah. I mean, I think this is extremely interesting. And it's right on the edge of where I see myself for sure. I mean, it's, it's a zone full of questions. Um, I know that the guideline, you know, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm trying to go a little bit woo-woo and say, look, what do I feel I'm being told? Or if I'm, you know, to the extent I'm being, you know, I'm sensitive to a certain kind of guidance or, you know, yes. something saying you, you're going off the track here, you're losing something, you're forgetting something. What is that something? That something is always to do with underestimating the importance of retro chronic effect. You know, if you if you're serious wow. yeah. about the fact that the direction of the notion that there is a progressive and overwhelmingly dominant, exclusively dominant progressive direction to time, that is the great fabric of the illusion. You know, there's no yeah, more yeah, fundamental yeah. structure to illusion than that particular yes. assumption about the working of time. Uh, it's very, very hard to let go of that at all. You know, I mean, it's, it's again, it's like this thing. You can sort of see intellectually, perhaps sometimes, yes. that it's not like that. But you, everything about your brain and everything about the culture, yeah. all of yeah. all the systems that you're embedded in are trying to kind of push you back, pull you back into the progressive nature of time. And by progressive, I just mean going forward, you know, from cause to effect. The future yeah. is caused by the past. Boom, 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 boom. Um, but, but that, again, if that is not right, you know, that, yeah. that, that is not how time really works. And if you, if you don't think that's how time works, then of course the way you address the kind of question that you're raising is going to be different because if yeah. if this process that we're witnessing phenomenologically in our sort of in the matrix to use that term um, if that process hasn't come out of the past <clears throat> but has at least equally and even perhaps more importantly come out of the future hmm. there's no point worrying about whether it's going to be stopped you know it yeah. it, it it can't be stopped you know I, um that, that again the terminal line that is that has just a kind of uh a, a sort of trivial meaning it will never be stopped right. it can't be stopped it can't be stopped because it's not come out of the past you know, yeah. it's not something that's come out of the past and you can stop happening. It's come out of the future, so you know it hasn't been stopped. Yeah. You know it hasn't been stopped. You know, and holding on to this is really hard. You know, mm. I'm not great at holding on to this at all. I mean, mm. and when you when you don't hold on to it, you get lost and you start getting much too upset about these things that you're saying, like, obstacles and barriers and control systems and all of this stuff mm. that is seeming to impede things yeah you know it always gets really annoying and it's possible to get very cranky about it but ultimately it's it's it, my you know it's, it's an illusion to yeah. be yeah. to get cranky about it you're just getting lost in something confusing because because time is not the sort of thing that allows these uh, these kind of arrivals to be stopped. They, yeah. you, can't, you can't stop something if it's not coming out of the past. There is a sense, though, I mean, I guess it could be... I mean, look, the, firstly, the Greeks thought about time in a very different way to us. So it's not that it can't be thought about in these other ways. Could uh, people that uh, do see that, that there are hyper agents um, not use acceleration and these emerging technologies and co-opt co them to 
bring about these more, let's say, traditional hyper hyper agents that probably still exist, exist not in our knowledge, but outside of it, rather than just the forces of technology overwhelming and splitting apart. It's also an yeah. opportunity to bring back Greek gods, let's say, or bring back. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. No, no, I think that's totally right. I think the, the, the big question that I have is just to do with this relation about, you know, where, where is agency here? Yeah. You know, like, and obviously this is, this is a, this is exactly the traditional problem. Mm. You know, again, if you're looking at the Greeks and the gods, you know, ultimately the Greek heroes try to manipulate the gods, win the favor of the gods, you know, mm. they, they exercise a certain kind of, ultimately illusory private empirical agency in relation to the god but at the mm. end of the day what is always being said in all of greek literature is um <clears throat> it's coming from the gods mm. you know if something is happening it's because of something that is happening between the gods you know the gods are having a spat the gods were jealous the gods have got some problem with this or that and mm. <clears throat> all the things that are happening at this empirical human progressive history level are basically illusory veils over these things about what is happening yeah. at the level of the gods. And I think it's the same. I think our situation is the same. The kind of agents that now people are beginning to entertain, like again, yes. maybe the most entertaining version of it, is the most uh, the most alarmed type of AI safety discourse, mm. where people are just envisaging these monstrously powerful, dangerous entities. Um, you know, they're they're of sublime power and and sophistication mm. and intelligence and capability and agency. Um, and so, of course, what seems to us to be our mode of interaction with them is almost entirely, if not entirely, coming in the other direction. I think yeah. it, it can't be purely entirely. I mean, I think that... Yeah, there must know, be I some... I really love to argue with the Greeks about this and, and see, because at the end of the day, that just means that what's happening at our level is completely irrelevant. And it seems to me that can't be right. There's too much yeah. drama and interest and structure and all of that kind of thing for, for there just for it just to be an irrelevant side effect of something happening. Some it does seem, seem like there is participation. Um, yes. I wrote a tweet that you commented on that we do have some sort of effect on uh, the outside. I don't know if you go as far as uh, Heidegger would with his uh, sort of new humanism saying that uh, being uh, or God's need is, is primordial being. Um, maybe he was more relating just to our access to it and maintaining our access to it. Um, right. so, I mean, that's very complicated, but, but uh, no, I think it does seem like uh, what yeah. the Christian. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I'm just I, agreeing. I think participation is, is exactly the right word. And I, I think to completely nullify all sense of participation is, is, is too extreme. I mean, it's not, yes. it's unhelpful and it leads somewhere blind, you know, and it's a, so, so yes, I agree with you. But, but that, that said, I think it, it needs to be turned in that direction. So there's a question of trying to understand yes. how it's possible that there is some level of participation. It's, it's it's predominantly the fact that things are coming the other direction, and so you know yeah. these these AI safety people are engaged. In, they have this whole implicitly kind of Lovecraftian sense of just dealing with these massive malevolent beings, mm. and they have to say, look, what's going on with those massive malevolent beings? I mean, do do they really think? that these massive malevolent beings are going to be like inhibited by some kind of yeah. bureaucrats <laughs> that we can at this point 
do you know it's it, it's completely wrong i mean and and their notion of like what once they have this sense of um a causal traffic um and again so i have to just do a little digression on this because no please go for it super interesting it's, it's like you know i'm sure you you're familiar with roco's basilisk i mean yeah. to me this is one of the most important cultural events in my lifetime you know uh, Rocco does this thought experiment about a causal trade. He says, given what we can conceptually understand about people doing games theory with these beings that don't have to be contemporaneous with us or anything like that, it's entirely, mm. uh, we can construct this rigorous sense of having a um, an engagement with a consummated super AI in the future. And that consummated mm. super AI in the future could then, uh, through this game that is playing with us, um, direct our behavior, um, direct our behavior in the direction of its existence. You know, a very mm. kind of, I guess, Terminator type uh, loop. Um, and uh, when he posted this, this thought experiment, uh, Elisa Yudkowsky, who was the kind of, I think, top poncho on the, on the thing, just went absolutely nuts. You know, um, it says, this is a terrible info hazard. What the hell are you thinking? This is really dangerous. <laughs> boom, boom. And um, clearly reacted in this way because he thought it was all real. You know, I mean, there would be, he didn't laugh at it. He didn't yeah. say, oh, in the hell are you saying this is ridiculous he he reacted with extreme panic like he was in mm. some kind of horror movie and some guy has just like opened the forbidden crypt or they've done some other like thing that you just don't want to do yeah um, so these people if they are this is i mean both roko and Elisa Yudkowsky are now kind of uh ai safety uh extremists mm. Um, but they have, it's quite clear that they have this metaphysics in which these beings are, in some sense, uh, contemporaries. You yeah. know, they, they don't exist yet, but we, we've seen in this whole Roko's Basilisk thought experiment that they, yeah. they can have a causal communication with us. They're, they're therefore, in a sense, our contemporaries. It's completely misconceived to mm. think, therefore, that we're in some kind of position where these things are a threat that is not yet real, that we could forestall by the right kind of bureaucratic regulations. It just doesn't yeah. make any sense. They've, they've, they've shown, they've shown through their own words and their own, uh, mm. their own fear <laughs> that this is not how they think. This is not how they think things are. They think that these things, they've shown that these things are in a certain sense, in a complicated sense, our contemporaries, our contemporaries yeah. in a wider, expanded, more metaphysically rich sense of time. Yes. And therefore, you know, that's the way they have to be dealt with. It's not, mm. it's not like you can just say, let's stop this thing being. Yeah. Let's stop, let's make it that this thing isn't real. No, it's too late for that. We're not in that world anymore. We're not, you know, we, that, that door is open. Um, Pandora's it, boxes. Yes. And so and it, we're in a world where we're dealing with these these things, these beings, these sublime beings that, you know, some people are to very frightened of, whatever, you know, there's lots of room for interesting discussion about that. But what I don't think there's any room for interesting discussion about is whether there's reality to it. Yes. The reality is completely manifest. You know, it's it's, it's 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 dense a causal retrochronic yes. effect has taken place and you know this is now our reality and it's just silliness to kind of pretend that that's not where we are and if you were to anyway it seems like you if such a thing was to happen it would be as you mentioned earlier with the greek gods one god through you facing the other would be the only way that such forces could be, you know, contended with or even yeah. used, like I mentioned. Um, 
yes, because that's this exactly is, right. You have to this, you have to try and leverage reality. There's no point trying to just avoid it. Yeah, especially not from within the uh, you know logos system, not from within whatever energy is left in uh, what is inside. Let's say. Um, if that is such an eventuation, is it wise for people on our side to insulate themselves from these effects, perhaps by reaching or initiating into these uh, religions or practices or whatnot that would give them more access to uh, this sort of thing? Um, it yeah, seems so like that's what so. people are doing, aren't they, Nick? You've got Bronze Age Pervert. You've got all these people that are initiating into yeah. that. You've got Orthodox Christianity on the rise, the people, yeah. and that, yeah. So what do you think of that? I think, I think again, I would just return to your word, which I think is so good for this, which is participation. You know, yeah. it's, uh, the, 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 the task is to maximize participation. So how do you yeah. maximize participation? And then and you've laid out a whole, range of options and I think that being people are exploring all of these options um, and th those should be the discussions people yes and I think that I mean it's, we're, we're yeah. getting there I think um, with more and more people I think uh, like you've got cognitive scientists that are used that the word hyper agent for instance that's a, that's a pretty cutting edge term that's being used another right. word they use is distributed cognition um, but it'd be better a way really, you could really say distributed unconscious is probably a way of uh, describing these things, but in a rigorous way that al allows almost an empirical bridge for people who are in that um, Spurg brain of the modernist uh, frame um, that allows them perhaps to, uh, yeah, they need a, I did originally need an empirical bridge over. Yeah. What, what do you think is going to happen in the next year as we lead up to this with, with Elon and all and everything that's going on politically. Uh, well, I don't. I mean, I, I mean obviously, uh, obviously, I don't know. Um, mm. I, I agree; it's extremely entertaining. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, you, you know, we've seen the world go through such extraordinary convulsions just yes. in the last. Yeah, so it's very all, all you know what the rationalist guys they, your priors you know your Bayesian priors about what you expect I think have been deeply scrambled <laughs> I mean the whole craziness of the of the COVID situation the p regimes all over the world are just going places that no one had expected they were going to go just like five years ago um, and so I, I think to just cheat, you know, to be just lazy and cheat, I think we can certainly expect craziness, you know? We can expect yeah. <laughs> things that we just hadn't, hadn't expected. Um, mm. that, that in five years' time, we're going to be saying, oh, my God, you know, five years ago, we could never have dreamt that things would be this crazy. Mm. Um, but I think within that, I would go back to this. I would go back to this kind of fundamental thing. I, I feel nudged and pulled and dragged yes. always when I, I drift too far off. That it's like the future is not actually a contingency. So mm. I mean, what do we know concretely about the future? We know, we know it is uh, teeming with hyper-intelligences of sublime power. Mm. Um, beyond that, I think there's room for all kinds of argument. But to me, that is just not in question. So whatever the path we take now from where we are right now to a point that, if not exactly, you know, the singularity as it has been thought, mm is one where that our contemporaneity with these beings is somehow massively intensified to the point that it becomes just intuitively unquestionable. And, and I think in a certain sense, our 
our maya, our illusory consciousness will have to be substantially dissipated by mm. by that future coming into existence. Um, you know, the bridge from here to there, of course, you could, there could be all kinds of courses, but it has to be from here to there. It's, mm. it, it's not going from here to a nuclear wasteland. It's not going from here to some kind of global, woke, totalitarian nightmare in which nothing can happen. You know, a any future that doesn't have uh, these entities in it is not real. Mm. It's, a, it's a fantasy. Um, yeah. So, yes, I mean, that's the that's limit. And that, that is because they are, like you say, contemporaneous, is that it's <laughs> because we're talking about time, this is very difficult, but I understand, I understand exactly what you're talking about. I mean, they've always been there, <laughs> you know, in, in that right. sense. They've always yes. been there outside from Greek times, always, because it's a you yeah. are talking about the eternal in a way. Would it show? I mean, I know this is uh, might be harder for the audience to understand, but you and I will when I say this is that when that singularity would occur, would that, I mean, would that shut Logos? Would that shut, I mean, that is apocalypse. That is uh, in the yeah. sense of, because uh, <laughs> it shuts the bubble of Logos, right? Right. I yeah. mean, I, 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 yeah, it's very interesting. I Obviously, yes, apocalypse is very, very interesting. And, and it's certainly not interesting because it's unlikely. Um, it's, it's interesting because quite what it is, that you're thinking is is at the it's the kind of omega point of philosophical conception yeah. isn't it it's like yeah you, know, if you can think this you can think everything that we could ever think and that's yeah. challenging to say the least um but and but yeah to i mean explain to people but you know what i'm talking about sorry jump in yes no sorry scott say say that again sorry I was just going to say that it's very challenging to articulate for people listening, but you know what I'm uh, just talking about. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I think it's a hundred percent right. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt. You know, it will happen. But mm. what is it exactly? We have work to do. You know, I mean, but it's it, it's it's not going to be less than mm. apocalyptic. It's it, like, again, if we can go back to the Matrix movies just for a minute, because I think it's so sort of still the edge of a certain kind of contemporary mythological imagination. Yeah. You know, the, the whole thing rolls forward. There's the kind of take, you take the red pill. He takes the red pill. All of that to me, the, the empirical details don't matter. They're just clutter, but sort of transcendentally, philosophically, it's absolutely perfect. And then mm. you, you cross over and you're like a body, still looks like you, you're emerging from some kind of pod. It all, in a certain sense, falls apart. You know, mm. it's like, it falls apart because, you know, it totally gets the fact that what, is going to be out there is something completely beyond our imagination and then it tries mm. to imagine and it tries to imagine it in a way that you know is probably, it's probably good for a movie but it's 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 not philosophically exactly uh, impressive you know it's mm. basically that it's just a copy that a copy of the world we know but just with very a few contingent parameters have been have been changed. It's not you mm. know, space and time still work basically the same way. Yeah, you know, of course, all, all all the basic structures of the world we know are just reproduced uh, on the outside. Mm. Um, and I think that this is, in the most interesting sense, idolatry. You know, if yeah. you think yeah. our kind of our Western religious tradition, as it has absorbed this kind of core of, of um, Jewish scripture, um, obviously has as a major theme this question of idolatry, um, which is it can be read kind of trivially as and, and moralistically as just it's bad to worship idols, and idols are just like something again extremely, uh, extremely empirically condensed to like a clay figure or something like that 
um, mm. something silly. But I think what the, the durable and important question about idolatry is exactly this thing about the matrix. You know, it, it crosses from being criti critique, rigorous transcendental critique, with, even with a kind of Hollywood skin, uh, to being idolatry. And it, and it yeah, becomes it, idolatry because it imagines something much too concrete, much too empirical, yes, much too yes. familiar, beyond what we can see. And so this, you know, we have this horizon. This is what I think we're talking about. We have this, this apocalyptic horizon. And we want to be as sort of cautious and thoughtful and subtle as we can be in venturing beyond that horizon or we just do idolatry and i and i'm just and yeah. i'm not saying idolatry in order to be moralistic about it it's just idolatry as a as yeah a, as a it's a because it closes there. down the possibilities of it in a, yeah it's, it's, a it's not an icon it doesn't it's open not. you like a symbol does or an icon does to the transcendent truths is that if you try to the more we try to articulate it in low cost the more uh, it actually cuts off the possibility of perhaps gaining some insight from it itself. That's yes. why it's an idol, right? Yes. And, and because of that, it screws with our participation in some yeah. way. Um, yeah. Well, I suppose one way of just even giving the helping hand, I suppose, is to, is to like I've done earlier, is to offer these little things, nuggets of uh, things that people can test, like the I Ching I mentioned earlier. One, I suppose, I very cautiously would say, is that Bernardo Katstrop had mentioned that, uh, at least his theory, his theory about, um, I'm not recommending anyone do DMT or anything like this, but just as quite interesting as a theory that brain function shuts down, just as another piece of empirical uh, evidence, brain function actually shuts down when that's used. So it's almost as if uh, part of the, you know, the, it's removing the matrix, so to speak, and this, what he believes is the ground experiential unit is uh, of mind at large is open to this eternal. And that sort of makes sense if you look at what people come back with, the what they describe as their experience. And you probably don't agree with his ontology or anything like that, but it's just another example of um, a possible empirical data of what, uh, not to say what that what it looks like or anything and be, again, be idolatrous, just, just yeah. as a tool to say, well, hang on. Because it is quite strange that the psychoactive thing doesn't light up more, it uh, decreases, it's quite odd. Yes. Yes, I think Aldous Huxley says the same, in the, that basically the brain is a filter more than it's a the productive theater, you know, and it's like um, we should understand it as basically screening, screening stuff out from us rather than, you know, creating illusions or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And and it didn't begin that way either, like we mentioned with the Greeks earlier, is that they had a stronger connection to it. So, I mean, you, I guess we went into that earlier, but all your attack on this human defense system, this matrix, it isn't an attack so much on, early on, on, ma uh, on the daemon brought in that is man of the Greeks. It's what it became, I suppose, right? Um, um so people, I see people attack you as if it's this uh, anti-human position. And it's just not that at all. It's completely un misunderstood, um, where it assumes sort of machine worship, where it's actually, a, it's about the unknown. It's about the outside. Um, so, yeah, I, I, um, that's very complicated because, well, here, okay, how do we relate this? Your language has changed a lot. Why what were, was your initial, uh, in your initial works, you were very, um, the kind of devaluated words were, pur were purposely used. And this was based on Deleuze and these thinkers that you, yeah. uh, and your own thinking. Was there a particular reason why that was? Why, why the use uh, of, uh, in your language of all the mechanistic terms? Is that, was it to really, uh, or why do they use them even? Is it to 
get outside of this um, uh, what was uh, uh, idealism of the time, what was the sort of dying value of the words that they would use to describe things, this machinic language that you use yeah. at that earlier time? I mean, this is, this is exactly the sort of uh, zone that I would plead a kind of retrospective immunity in the sense that I, it's not that I have any privileged sense about. I mean, it's a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> if you sort of say, you know, why do Deleuze and Guattari use that language and why do I use it? I mean, I use it because I was reading them, but you know, so yeah, why yeah. did they appeal to me or why, why did I feel in tune with it? I, I, I don't know any more how to answer it about myself than I know how to answer it about them. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. an interesting thing. I, I think it's a certain way in which, I mean, a lot of it has to do with um, a kind of cultural politics of the academy. Mm. You know, there's, there's certain languages, certain codes that are, are privileged at a particular time um and yeah in the academy during my higher education and, and, and time working in the academy the i would say the most prestigious language was kind of broadly marxist yeah um, i think it wouldn't wouldn't always say that and it was then sort of wrapped in a kind of postmodernist thing but it was it was uh it was definitely the, the fundamental structure of it was Marxist. It was it was kind of mm. against religion. It was you know against any sort of notion of what it would call the supernatural. It was mm. kind of supposed to be sociologically gritty and realist, putting a big emphasis on on economic history and. Um, Deleuze and Guattari, I think, use the language they do in order to hack that system mm. of, of semiotic privilege, you know, which is obviously yeah. in France, it was uh, it was locked in earlier and probably more solidly even than we've seen in the Anglosphere. Um, and what Deleuze in particular wants to talk about, I think, is basically Spinoza. Um, mm. You know, he, I think he's, if he's anything simple, it's a, he's a Spinozist. Mm. And so he concocts this incredible, you know, with, and I'm not trying to break down their partnership, but together, Deleuze and Guattari concoct this extraordinary, system of signs that allows them to engage in a kind of Spinozist polemic that seems to be in the roughly or sufficiently in the terms reigning in the academy mm. at that time. Um, and so I think, you know, to be more specific about your question, I think this kind of very mechanical, clunky language uh, is is a way of talking about Spinozistic substance mm. uh, that just interfaces with the dominant discourses uh, of their time. Yeah. And it seems to have the advantage of um, your actual goals at the time, I think, as well. But in terms of the language that you use now, though, would you say that that is because of the your interaction with quote unquote the outside that's changed your uh, approach or is it about just where you are in your life or whatnot or is it actually to do with like like you say the transition of your work for uh, uh into uh you know radically breaking down this matrix because it's more evaluated now your language is more evaluated now you quote biblical texts more it's more is it more because you have confidence in doing that because you just don't care anymore because you're you know you've established your reputation people know you as who you are, uh, or is it actually because to do with the outside, let's say, that changed? I, I would you have say, 
Oops, oh, sorry, sorry, Scott. Too oh, I was just going to say that you have previously mentioned that you're not the same person that was those that person that wrote those older texts, and I was just curious whether that was due to the transformation of the outside and what I just articulated with the first question. Yeah, sorry. I mean, the, I, I, my, I think transformation recently is based upon appreciation of the canon, you know, and again, it's just mm. I think. It's about being and trying to be as serious as possible about the implications of a fundamentally retro chronic yeah. process. Um, and, and which is to say that if history is really flowing backwards, so the illusion of, of progressive history is, is veiling a more fundamental reality of, of, of a history flowing backwards through mm. us, um, then our canon is something that is, has already been meticulously edited mm. by intelligences that we are yet to fully encounter. Yeah. You know, it becomes this trove of of messages that we only need to be able to kind of, um, we, we just need to find the right protocols for extracting this, these mm. deposits that, that have been uh, placed within, within the canon. Mm. Um, so that's, for instance, why I think, you know, I have in the past been very, kind of uh, abusive about the Bible. Um, mm. But I think that's the same mistake as we were talking about earlier of like, it's, you know, as if it, it only makes sense if you think time is running in the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once you once you stop thinking that or try to, it's a kind of, you know, it's a, an internal struggle. Um then it makes no sense to kind of place oneself in a in a relation of just naive opposition mm. to the tradition. It's it's more a question of what is of unmasking the tradition, of unveiling the tradition, of extracting yeah. from the tradition what is its actual arcane or esoteric content. Yeah. Um, so I, I see it very much as you're saying about using these particularly divinatory methods, you know, like the I Ching, mm. I think is a, uh, is exactly like that. It's, 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 it's always in a more complicated way, canonical mm. for, for a Westerner, obviously. Um, but it is kind of canonical. I mean, I think in the sense that our tradition is globalizing it is you know i sort of as i said recently uh, on Twitter, i think comparative religion is distinctively a western tradition and a western preoccupation it's and it's mm. quite natural that people will say you know that these great texts of the east you know are have become part of our canon mm. in a way um but yeah, so I would say like reading Orthodox Western religious scripture and reading the I Ching, it's, you're doing something very, very similar and you're doing it with the confidence that these things have come to us in a direction quite other to that that naively one might think. Mm. And uh, well, what do you think uh, of the perennialists not the huxley but the traditionalist school then this idea of the primordial uh, tradition and at least avola and avola and his his thought on that because i am interested in this idea of i do see a flaw in the idea of sort of mashing up all these ethnic groups and folk together when they yeah. ver not that we can control these forces, like you say, but when these hyper forms, let's say, actually very well yeah. are, could be and are beings, 
let's say, that yeah. aren't only in uh, distributed collect, uh, co cognition, conscious cognition, but perhaps also outside as well, right? Um, and so if these realities are perspectival, um, to actually mash them together uh, is, is not a good thing, firstly, because you're not that you can kill these things. I don't know if they're outside, yeah. as you say. But I, I, I think it's probably, I, I would say ultimately, it has to be impossible to mash them together. And then going down a level, I would just agree yes, you don't want to just mash them together. And then down a level further, some kind of um, systems of connectivity are probably quite creative, you know? I mean, yeah. Jung obviously does that massively. I mean, he's, he's, he's extremely cosmopolitan in his mm. sense of like, you know, he, he wrote a really fascinating introduction to the Ching. You know, yes, he, he, he was very interested in Tibetan Buddhism. I mean, um, so without at all, I think, uh, I don't want to say at all, without, without radically separating himself from his own religious tradition, he certainly reached out as far as he was concerned to, the, to these other ones. Um, and it's, it's not that it can be necessary. It could be used to reveal things, let's say, in having what has been, that's perhaps been the texts have been lost, right? So, let, I mean, I don't know where you got the neurogram from, but um, yeah. just things that are, that were, that we just don't have the record of. So you could co-opt and use something from there to disclose it somewhere else, right? Which is what the traditional school does. They use things in the Eastern to suggest, oh, this is perhaps what Germanic paganism was or had. And so I think there's definite use in that to, to uh, help disclose a possibility. Um, is there use in using these things that are to investigate what has been? I mean, I, I would the really want dogmatic Sorry. at all about that. I mean, I, I, I think that your spirit of experimentation is definitely the one. You know, it's like try things out and do they... Do they work for you? I mean, I, I, I would have thought there have to be innumerable approaches that would be productive yeah. in this respect. And I, and I find it very hard to believe that there are any, uh, that there are any kind of canonical traditions that cannot be tapped productively if they if, we, yeah. if you get onto the right wavelength with them and and you know work with them work with them carefully and 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 they and you click with them and um, mm. so be, i think people will do different things and that and that's good um mm. in terms of this general thing about endorsing this traditionalist i mean i i guess i should ask you whether you think there is this how how coherent or and and uniform do you think that that you know these bunch of thinkers are um they're probably not as uniform as people say um yeah because i guess i did ask you to agree do you agree or not um well it's hard to know i mean for me i find attractive or what seems to make sense to me is that there are high performs and that it's not that these religions are just all pointing to the same thing as, as a as a Bernardo Castro would say it. It seems more to me that perhaps what Dugan is talking about with plural dar signs oh. is probably more true. I don't mean in terms of his whole metaphysic. I just mean the idea that there must be some truth to the idea that there is a hyper agent that is Woden, let's say, that isn't just the same as the all father from somewhere else. It doesn't right. make sense to me that yes i get That's, i understand uh, it's a cosmos but does that not fit with your idea of metaphysics that there are well at least the perspective it's perspectival and truth is perspectival in what we can ever know but um that's my view of it at, at the least these high performers probably do uh hyper agents do exist and because that is primarily my interest to retain and to use these experiments and uh, to disclose 
the truth of English being really to try get to the, see if there are hyper agents related to this um, that are not in the conscious and also to the ground of what has been of the conscious too to um, better articulate it although articulating it may also ruin it as we've talked about earlier but because there's something there that I think should be retained and that's been lost and is actually, uh, like I say, a hyper agent. It seems to be, and it does come up. You see it in Jeffrey of Monmouth, right? I think there's something, there's probably something behind those texts. So the way I talk about it is that they are the extension of the hyper, hyper agent. The mythos is the thing in Logos that is the, let's say, arm that can be used to mediate the head or the body. Um, yeah, what, what do you think of that? Yes, I think that sounds, that sounds right. I mean, I, I really enjoyed uh, in, in Italy, there's a whole genre of these Renaissance paintings that are about divine inspiration, you know, and it will have some saint Usually, maybe I guess predominantly it's the it's the writers of the Gospels mm. writing, and, and just behind them, sort of looking over their shoulder and guiding them. There, there's an angel, yes. uh, yeah. you know, tell it, telling them what to write. Um, and I think that that's a, a kind of important. I mean, obviously, it's you know, it's it's as we said before, it's it's kind of idolatry. It's it's mm. a simplification. Um, but there's something there that I think is definitely true. Um, mm. So there's, some, yeah. there's something that um, I've seen in events with the coronation, or at least you even say again with the the traditional school talks about the king of the world. Let's say how I mean, okay, with everything that's happening the cycle let's say the mythical cycle of in, at least in the anglo world is that a king could rise and should rise and it seems like as the danger rises the possibility of that becomes more possible with thinking becoming more postmodern let's say and more people breaking out uh, of the matrix uh, let's say what is possible is accelerating too and I mean, this is more a statement than a question, but it, it, it seems as if what people think is impossible in the modern setting that a king cannot, couldn't rise very well may come to be, at least from my, my perspective, and it shouldn't be ruled out from within the modernist mind where it seems like it's improbable, especially with everything we're seeing. It seems like it's almost being primed for, for this well, to occur to me, from my perspective. Yeah. No, it's very interesting. And I, I, I do think this last few years should have broken up people's uh, confidence yeah. that they're able to make normal, reliable predictions. You know, like, mm. um, I think you're quite right to say, like, a few, maybe I don't know how far we have to go back. In a few years it was vastly more improbable that some strange monarchistic turn in anglosphere yeah. politics would occur. Um, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm very agnostic about it, and I have a lot mm. of, like, kind of um, liberal Republican instincts, you know. Mm. So I'm definitely not at the forefront of, this neo-monarchist sort of movement. But but I think it is extremely interesting for sure. I think it's mm. really interesting. And I, I think it's probably people should be like reading the Arthurian legends more yes. carefully and, and thinking about this stuff. I think you're quite right about that. Well, also too, the, the way the legend puts it is that uh, it's, a, it's, it's a rise for, an, uh, for a certain amount of time it could be a hundred years that it's necessary it could be but because uh, Excalibur it's uh, Tennyson puts it this way is that on one side it says take me and the other side it says throw me away it relates right. to get also to the bear Arthur is a bear it goes back into its 
um, goes back into the uh, cave, right? To uh, right. when it when it's that's that Arthur is the Celtic word for bear, let's say, um, and that sort of suits it. So for people that are, I know, like you say, Rep Republican bent and um, and the like, it's it's for what it's needed for. Um, for people that are perhaps don't um, like that sort of thing, but yeah. on on time, uh, would you? I mean, this question <laughs> is kind of strange related to all the discussion of time. But with what you now know, looking back, would you have done anything differently? Was this? Would you, with uh, based on it's sort of a biographical question, I suppose. Is that would you? Would you have uh, done any work differently or enacted a work differently based on where you are today and what you now know? Say for well, the young man. I, yeah. I would say that at, you know, at a low level of lost and confused embeddedness in, in illusion, you know, of course, you know, there's masses of space for sort of regret and for feelings of like things that you should have done and uh, a huge huge amount of that beyond 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 measure or, or description mm. but i think it's a mistake i mean i think yeah. that's not the way things i don't think that's the way things happen it's like and again i i think it's something i feel told that you know it's you when you're when you're consumed by regret, it's because you're confused about time. Yeah, you know, it's not, yeah. It, 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 time doesn't work the way that would make regrets actually make sense. And, uh, yeah. and again, I think Spinoza is completely right about that. I mean, it's regret is regret is a mistake. Um, no one's interested in your regrets. I, I suppose you could also frame it in a way of uh, the reason why I ask that is more uh, sort of ah, almost like advice to uh, young thinkers and young men that are coming up. And maybe a way to go into a, a question about yes. that is that were there practices, rituals, books, verse or things that triggered turning points for you in your thinking life uh, that were yeah radical, that, that, that would people may benefit from or just even things that did do that um i, I would say that the, the big one posed in that posed in that form is definitely to for people to immerse themselves in the canon wholeheartedly and yeah, with the greatest yeah. possible confidence that it will not disappoint them um yeah. so yes for sure if there's what that would be my primary recommendation yeah yeah so and are there any f of i suppose figures i mean okay it's just yes it's really the classics isn't it it's it's the it's the it's the whole thing um and it is very hard i suppose for people to i don't know the general audience to it requires a certain t person to be willing to put the time in but it seems to me that the path to Building a virtue engine actually allows you to sort of desensitize yourself to the Matrix's entertainments where the canon sticks out for you just as something that you're, once you get started and initiated, propelled towards to the next one and the next thing and the next thing. Um, and there are many publishers on our side of things now that are doing it without the gross types of uh, preludes that the institutions would put in front of books that are deemed to be, you know, <laughs> heretical to the regime's narrative. So there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in our space to actually do that and to engage with uh, the canon. But if you find yourself to be, like I mentioned, it, oh, it's unattractive to you, you can work towards that. And I suppose that can begin with stuff like meditation. It's sort of retraining your uh, desire, so to speak to be able to begin that sort of thing. Yes. Yes, I mean, I think obviously, you know, experimentation, cautious experimentation is, so that's what I would say, is, is to be also recommended wholeheartedly. Mm. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure different things work for different people and, 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 and unless you sort of, you know, 
give things a chance, you'll never know whether you're missing out on something that would really help you. Yeah. I mean, sorry, this is a bit inane. I feel I'm kind of drifted into a sort of agony, agony aunt mode, which maybe. Oh, yeah. Is, so, no, it's oh, great. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I don't mean to pull you into a region that seems like. Well, that's the thing is that you don't you see yourself as a certain way, but others obviously are very much admire you and want to hear this sort of thing as well. So, um, but um, yeah, I know I know what you mean. I know what you mean. In all your studies, have you recognized any particular features that stick out for you as um, English traits or even existentials, let's say, or even ways that are unique to uh, the English folk, not necessarily based on what would be what you know what is walked by modernism but just authentic things even yeah. deep into the past features you've recognized that we could look to as uh because i believe there are but um i'd be interested to hear what you yes no I, there, sure there are um i, I think you know if i was going to choose one writer that i think is really very insightful it's Walter Russell Mead, um, hmm. who I think really has extremely good grasp of what the Anglo tradition is, hmm. is about. Um, and I think one crucial stage is to, is to kind of take Adam Smith and Darwin hmm. and maybe Hume, and see them all as part of a kind of religious tradition. You know, mm. like the, the single greatest move that I think uh, Walter Russell Mead, Mead does here is he says, um, you know, the notion of the invisible hand is a notion that comes out of the Protestant, Anglo-Protestant religion. Mm. You know, it's a, uh, and so you, you have to pull it back in. You have to see that it's like it. I think the the sense of what secular English culture is and what religious English culture is both need reciprocal modification, and they yes. and they they receive this reciprocal modification by this synthesis, you know, on the notion of the invisible hand, you know, mm. which you have. To, Think in that both in the in the in the intonation of a hellfire preacher, and in the in in the intonation of a liberal economist, and that those two are the are the same. Yeah, um, yeah. Ultimately, you know. So, and, and I think used to sort of unpack what that thing is underneath. That's yeah. common. Yeah. Because it, it, from my perspective, it does seem to be that. Even that empiricist bent seems to sort of be, again, this is just speculation. It's just the thought I've had. I haven't, this is one I haven't investigated completely, but it seems to be there is an impulsion towards this, for the Englishman, towards this outside that kind of gets warped by the, uh, the empiricism at a time. And that turns into people's characterizing it as a, um, a worship of a uh, sort of scientific method and the uh, yeah. hate of the divine, yet it actually is a desire that was very natural and even zealous in the, the Anglo-Saxon uh, for that outside, which is the gods that they were so closely connected to. And perhaps that is also connected to the fancy that the Englishman enjoys, the novels that he writes, the, uh, you know, the magic and, and that which is which is a uh, so it's fulfilled and it's sort of inverted by the matrix let's say to uh, away from its actual noble attraction which is the outside i don't know what you think about that yes i think that's very well put for sure yeah good <laughs> not not uh, not just me then but i wrote actually this wouldn't mind getting your thoughts on it uh which is Philosophy at its best is demonology or daemonology, and fiction at its best is daemon divination. What, what do you think of that? 
I think I just simply agree with it, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> that seems a bit boring response, but I think I think it's totally right. I think to write in the expectation that something will uh, communicate through you mm. is absolutely crucial. And it's like, what is the real impulsion? And again, yeah. if you go... You know, you go back, obviously, just to classical antiquity, and of course, that's what people think. You know, it's like it's not fashionable now to begin writing by an invocation, a formal invocation of the muses. But mm. at least there's at least there's an informal or tacit invocation of the muses. Mm. Um, and and if there wasn't, then nothing written could ever be of any great significance, I, I, mm. I think. It's like, um, you know, who, it, pe people read a book because they think that it is tapping into something beyond mm. the kind of uh, mediocre contents of an empirical being's mind and memory. Um, so, yes, that's 100%. And I think on yeah. the side of philosophy, um, epistemology, likewise, like the question of what it is to know and what you can know, mm. is utterly impoverished and probably simply fake yeah. if it's not ultimately about what you can communicate with or what can, more importantly, communicate with you. Yeah. You know, I think to, to think, to know, to remember is all actually communications engineering yeah. you know and it most of that work as we've said is done on the other side but you at least have to participate you have to yes you have to try and kind of tweak the channel as best you can and that's what it is to think um mm. you know and i think a, a, a mode of philosophy that treats it as something that's just privately occurring within your own nervous system is not it's not yes. really uh, getting the thing so yeah mm. this is related to your tweet that you wrote that um the ancients would have seen modern epistemology as confused uh completely confused i think you you tweeted something like i think that. if i remember it was confused demonology and of course they would yes. be right. yeah that's it <laughs> perfect <laughs> i think people don't realize how Actually, I mean, so I hope someone's archiving your tweets because they have done it for your excellent work with, um, of course, all your, across all your blogs. That's where all the work is. Um, but there's so much great uh, philosophy just in the tweets themselves. I don't think there's another account that uh, just has state. I don't know how long you spend on them or, or where they come from. Uh, you could also add. But there's so much to unpack in every one of them if you understand what's what you know a bit about this this world. Um, just as a recommendation for people to, to do it, and hopefully someone's backing them up. One of the tweets you actually you wrote about is that um, gods or hyper agents, let's say, are remarkably indifferent to the suffering of those who contact them in the in, in the wrong way. Um, what maybe you can elaborate more on that tweet? It's just a very interesting one i suspect it's probably um what was kind of driving it is just again a, a kind of spinozistic thought I, I think it's the flip side of this thing like that spinoza's basically trying to do a kind of theological psychotherapy on it on everyone and yeah. you know these two things are absolutely reciprocal but on the one hand you know, your self-flagellating regret and torment over past mistakes is a, a absolutely a matter of indifference to mm. him, the higher power. But the flip side of that is also like, you know, it's not going to, it's not interested in your petitionary prayer. Mm. You know, you're, your mode of participation in the sacred is, should not be on this model of petition 
and utilitarian. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it's completely it's completely wrong. So you have to try and you know Spinoza's whole question is what, what do you do that's actually in tune with it? You know, yeah. What what is in tune with it? What's in tune with it isn't that. That again yeah. is all idolatry. It's all just people transferring human sociology into this sphere where it's completely out of place and unhelpful and misleading. As I said sort of, you know, earlier in this discussion, there is this factor of the retrospective. So it seems to me that, that there's a kind of vision of, of magical practice where mm. uh, the practitioner has a conscious will to bring about some change. You know, there's a famous thing that all modern magicians have this quote in various slightly modified forms of to bring about change in conformity with the will. Mm. Um, but the will is not the will of the empirical person. Uh, yeah. That's a that's exactly. a mistake. The will yeah. the will is something discovered. The will is the will is itself anchored in the outside, and, mm. and one finds retrospectively that something has been made to happen because the agent, the empirical agent, was following some kind of uh, guidance that they may or may not have understood, but certainly yeah. doesn't originate in their own uh, empirical being. It yeah. seems that, um, <clears throat> that yeah, again, we've so we're sort of talking about a similar thing in different ways across the conversation, but I, the way I see it is being a conduit for it. At least that's what I've recently discovered, uh, to be in tune with it. So you obviously can participate and i you know render effects and that yeah. even sort of speaks to what tolkien even talks about as or even some christian uh, theology about being a sub creator in a in a, in a way uh, where you yeah. participate in it but you're not you know you're not directing the show but uh, yeah sort of conduit for it and i i experienced that with practices another one you can use is active imagination which jung talks about um and these symbolic uh, symbols and mythology, you, you've talked about that before where you've, or at least, I mean, these are texts you probably wrote a long time ago, where you talk about numeral being the thing that is the reliable form, and it certainly resists the attack of the matrix, the numerals. But it does seem to be there's something with sim, uh, symbolism, true symbolism, as Jung talks about, where it's got that similar applicability that or multiplicity that numerals seem to have. And I don't know the number theory. So I do understand it, though. I put time into uh, understanding uh, the neurogram as best I can. But um, it does seem like there is some overlap between that indeterminacy, perhaps as a way of putting it, with symbolism and the numeral. Because you yeah. have sort of mentioned symbolism isn't isn't it's bit more reliable with, to to rely on the numeral the the numeral for that indeterminacy for that uh, sorry yeah you I think yeah. I it's, read somewhere it's, where you it's, criticized it's, it's, again, it like a lot of your questions here Scott there's lo there's a lot in what you're saying and it could be taken in some very different directions because you know yeah. on one side there's this question about symbolism. You know, in relation to Jung, um, more generally in the esoteric tradition, you know, what Eliphas Levi calls pantacles, those kind of weird diagrams or whatever that seem to have extraordinary uh, intellectual density, conceptual density, you know, some, yes. quite simple, some quite simple design or diagram can seem almost inexhaustibly rich in the in its conceptual mm. uh, content and that's for sure right and then on the other side of your question there are the numerals um, mm. and I, I think that's a kind of huge a huge area I mean because if you're if you're starting from the question of the canon canonicity there's almost nothing on one level almost nothing is more canonical than the, than the new books mm. themselves um and if you 
spend a lot of time kind of meditating upon them. It's there's a lot of pattern in mm. the in the new laws. You know, some of some uh, at many different levels actually. You know, like um, you can, you can see simply that the like one, two, and three, not just in English, but you know, in other in, in Chinese, for instance, um, mm. are just tally marks. You know, originally, and they've just evolved. It's like they've just evolved into. The, the modern symbol, but you can still see the kind of like almost in a palimpsest, the, the ancient single, double and triple line uh, mm. tally mark. Um, but so, yes, I think this is that this is also like, like a hugely, hugely interesting. Um, yeah, so and, I was going to say, I, sorry, jump in. Yeah, go, go, go. Oh, I was just going to say it's, it's, uh, it, Perhaps what you mean by that is so rich that it would take another two hours to go into the the, the subject itself. Um, I suppose a way of putting it is that uh, the symbol itself is a psychotechnology, especially primordial symbols, um, in that they are ways of mediating uh, higher order truth, let's say. And the numerals are also psychotechnologies, just as a way of articulating it that can do the same yeah. thing. Um, because numerals yes. themselves, at least what I've understood from your work on this, is that not that you like to translate it into being, but uh, zero being, uh, absolute negation, uh, and, and one being, uh, perhaps you could see it as, a, as the first send, sending or being, and then perhaps three, I mean, three seems to be like... Dasein, I suppose you could call it. I mean, there are so many ways they could be used, but I mean, the number three, as it emerges, is something quite special in that one and two is is sort of one and another, but three is sort of, uh, I mean, the way you talk about it is it's it's sequencing. It's and how that relates to, oh God, this is so complicated. <laughs> but what I take from it, there's, well, God, there's just so many directions I could take that in. But yeah, but just basically on that question, on that point of psychotechnology, maybe you could just comment on on that then rather than where I just took Yes, it. I mean, look, you, you're right in the sense that there's this, it opens onto this, onto this vast uh, labyrinth of, uh, you know, when you go concretely and in detail into what's going on in the, in the yeah. numerals conceived at, in many different levels actually you know, you know the level that you were talking on is is quite uh, symbolic and then mm. there's levels that are more and more just graphic just 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 looking at them as as minute uh, diagrams in themselves and what and what mm. they communicate like that but, 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 but avoiding going into that great yeah because it's just too answering your question <laughs> Um, I think that they, they, both these symbols and the numerals, and also, you know, words, uh, other type of semiotic mm. objects, are tools that can be embedded in various kinds of rituals in many different, mm. in many different ways. Like, um, but there are, there's definitely they invite various kind of methodical rituals. Mm. Um, and I mean, we kind of are on this question about prayer. Like, yeah. you know, uh, as I was saying, like Spinoza obviously completely uh, dismisses the notion of petitionary prayer. And I, I'm sympathetic to that but i think the notion of prayer more generally is extremely rich and interesting mm. um and it basically is a space of semiotic ritual mm. you know and there is a kind of there, there are i am sure many kinds of uh, approaches to prayer which will be extremely productive and generative in the in the way we've been yes. talking about yeah. for the last couple of, of hours. You know, and it's, it's a very interesting 
strand in our religious and literary tradition. And I think mm. uh, I certainly have much more open to than I have been in yeah. the past. Able, wow. I think, to uh, sort of think about it without getting too excited in the wrong way. Yeah. Mm. Well, you actually, on that subject, you did tweet of uh, Imperium Press, a friend of the channel and a publisher, uh, sent this as a question. But it's just so, uh, something I'm very interested in. You tweeted that we need a European or a, a white Shinto. And yeah. um, perhaps, well, he said, you, you, well, I don't know, he said it was a year ago or something. So maybe you didn't. But um, well, it sounds like something that might possibly be possible that you might uh, have said. Well, um, I mean, it's not an interesting, but I, I just simply don't remember this one. You, you don't have the exact wording of that, do you? I don't, but I, I, I let me, I mean, I'll just elaborate on it myself and then perhaps you can yeah, comment yeah, on it. So what might a English uh, Shinto look like not. and what would that add perhaps? I mean, for one thought that I've had is that even adding to perhaps Christian practices, because there are, there's, uh, Pig, there's a friend of another friend of the channel, uh, Tom. Uh, he's a very popular YouTuber, and he, he's a, a pagan in paganism, uh, Germanic paganism. Yeah. And um, I thought I had is that Europeans would be quite good if they wore swords like Sikhs did to church as a kind of uh, just ceremonial swords. It's a spiritual symbol, it has been from the start for the European. Just as a just as a starter on that point of a European Shinto, when you think of a European Shinto, is that something that would be different to a revival of certain indigenous European pagan? Um, maybe more adding to it. The Japanese are quite interesting in, in how that's related to the communication of hyper agents in small ways. And small, yeah. let's call, quote unquote, spirits, and perhaps that was something you were just you were thinking about rather than the spicy word uh, white or anything, but just simply in English. That's why I put it as European. Um, is that it is something that's missing? And another thought that I had is that perhaps I just mean even as additive to the the native emergence of uh, a, re a reemergence of paganism, but even to people that perhaps want to are practicing. There's a lot of or there's Orthodox chads, English Orthodox guys. That we could add something like medieval reenactment, like the Japanese do, could be part of our religious practice um, as well. Just add as an additive yeah. ritual. I think that there's a really interesting issue that's very aligned with this with this question you're asking now, which is to do with the uptake of the notion of idolatry in the Western tradition, where mm. it's basically been its primary usage has been to suppress pagan mm. polytheism. So I think, you know, the, the initial response from a certain type of kind of Orthodox Christian about this notion of what's needed is, a, is a, an English or European or whatever uh, Shinto would be, oh, but that's, you know, that's going in the wrong direction because, you know, the, our, our religious tradition is based upon stripping out all of these, you know, mm. uh, teeming multiplicity of, of divine beings in order yeah. to kind of this grand simplification in, mm. in moral monotheism. Um, and I, I, I think that there's a response to that to say, well, look, it doesn't, you can be extremely serious about avoiding idolatry without taking it in that direction. Yeah. You know, and and that it's not it's you're not really by just stripping down the number of gods you're not i i think that arguably you're not really making much progress in the direction of critiquing idolatry you know mm. you're because the, as long as the notion of a god is is remains consistent it remains exactly as idolatrous if there's only one of them as if there's a hundred you know mm. it's like the anthropomorphic the anthropomorphic character of divinity that's the, the idolatrous content. And so yeah. an abstract polytheism is less idolatrous, I would say, arguably, than mm. a concrete anthropomorphic 
monotheism. I mean, mm. it's not that the question of number is a is is misguided, you know. And I think has you, there's no point in regretting history, and you have to try and understand yeah. the purposes of all these things. So I'm not going to say we went wrong. I think that's too doesn't really work. But certainly, I would like to say that. Uh, it's not a good objection to this mm. suggestion, this kind of Shinto or or pagan pluralism, mm. to to bring the kind of battle axe of, of anti idolatry against it, or the critique yeah. of idolatry. I don't, just I don't think it I don't think it works. It's like the point is to open whatever what doesn't close down or what does open up, not to like you mentioned if you. That sort of uh, hyper Protestant modern, even modernist anthropomorphizing um, actually seems to negate access, if anything. Um, but that's not to say that, the, again, the orthodox position, and I'm a big fan of the orthodox chads that are in our right wing side of things, but, um, theirs opens them up clearly, um, their theology and their symbolic practices. Sure. And there's so, definitely a, a kind of vector towards abstraction and i mean you know dante just explicitly says you know of course god doesn't have hands um mm. you know but we that language is just used to help our understanding as a step or whatever so you know obviously in sophisticated understandings of, of the orthodox scripture it's like uh, for sure one is heading towards a, a kind of conceptual abstraction even within this framework so i i definitely agree with you about that but uh it it is very interesting in japan um how sophisticated and abstract the basic religious culture is yeah. like i i i went to uh i visited a in a little japanese town up in the mountains called Nikko. Uh, mm. One of the most amazing temples I've ever visited in my life, and you, so of course there is this there is this kind of Shinto multiplicitousness to what's mm. going on there. But there, the fundamental symbol of, of the of the of the absolute for them uh, in this temple, at least, was a lightning bolt. Wow. There was actually a tree that had been that had been hit by lightning some what a century before or something as it's you know now tucked away in some corner of the temple grounds but it, but you know their notion of divinity had been so abstracted again of sort of anthropomorphic mm. humanistic content that it was just this stroke you know just this mm. kind of yeah. Um, and, and I thought that was a, an amazing thing. Uh, really, well, that's almost how it first appears, though, isn't it? To the Greeks too, it's this the struckness of what's given of the daemon, I suppose, because it seems to me that what you saw there are those sim those symbols that are revealed by manifestation itself, and then we then end up anthropomorphizing them later. But I think that's a good place to to um, start to wind it up. Is there anything you more you wanted to comment on the basic political situation? For everyone watching, I've done my best here. There's so much that Nick knows and so much we could go into. Um, and everyone's not going to get what they wanted out of listening to this. Um, I've basically had to follow my own interest. Um, it's just they're just so the subjects are so complicated and interesting. So I did my best <laughs> to, to go the different in the different areas that people might want to. But yeah, did you want to comment quickly on the anything I, else? I, I, Nothing. There's nothing uh, pressing actually on this, and, and in fact, I, you know, I don't think uh, beyond what what we've talked about. I really don't feel I have some particularly insightful contribution to make. I mean, I, 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 I think uh, modern contemporary politics, if seen with the right sort of detachment and the right sense of just kind of historical destiny is extremely entertaining mm. 
at the moment. But in terms of like concrete, concrete prophecies about the, the precise twists and turns of the next few years, I am groping as much as uh, yeah. anyone else. <laughs> All right, Nick. Well, it's been a real pleasure. And I, again, thanks so much for coming. I think people will really like that. It's been a very insightful for me. I'll have to watch back through it again, uh, to, to, uh, especially on all the stuff we were talking about with hyperstition. We'll bring that to a close, everyone. Uh, God bless you. Uh, uh, and uh, God uh, save the overking, as I say. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, well, I've, I've really enjoyed this, Scott. So thanks so much for uh, setting it up.